Buenos días, buenos días a todos. Bienvenidos a este nuevo seminario organizado por, por FUNSEAM en colaboración con la Cátedra de Sostenibilidad Energética de la Universidad de Barcelona. En esta ocasión, bajo el título eh, Pacto Verde Europeo, clave contra el COVID-19, nos centraremos en el papel que va a desempeñar o que puede desempeñar la transición energética en un momento como el actual donde es necesario reactivar la situación económica. En estos momentos donde los efectos económicos de la pandemia sanitaria ocasionada por el COVID-19 son más que evidentes, este nuevo escenario, este nuevo seminario de FUNSEAM se centra en el papel del sector energético, la transición hacia un modelo descarbonizado como motor y palanca de crecimiento económico. Y precisamente para abordar esta cuestión, hoy contamos con el profesor Andreas Loscher, quien aparte de una dilatada trayectoria profesional, investigadora en el ámbito de la economía de la energía, desde el año 2011 preside la Comisión de Expertos Independiente Energía del Futuro, una comisión creada por el Ejecutivo alemán para asesorar y apoyar al Gobierno federal a nivel científico en el desarrollo y búsqueda de soluciones y estrategias conjuntas en el ámbito de la transición energética alemana, la Energiewende. Ocupando Alemania desde hace muy pocas semanas la presidencia del Consejo de Europa, la Comisión de Expertos recientemente presentó su documento de recomendaciones, donde se recoge un paquete de estímulo económico integral con una apuesta decidida por las tecnologías renovables, que debe servir de base para la definición de la política energética germana de futuro, así como las discusiones a nivel comunitario sobre el paquete de estímulo verde y qué protagonismo debe desempeñar en la recuperación económica. Este paquete de estímulo aborda áreas, como veremos en su presentación, áreas muy relevantes para la transición energética alemana, en particular la economía del hidrógeno, el desarrollo de las infraestructuras energéticas o la movilidad sostenible. Todo ello sin olvidar aspectos tan relevantes como la reforma del mercado y el proceso de formación de precios de la energía, aspecto crucial en la competitividad económica. Un paquete de estímulo que eh, toma en consideración y recoge las diferentes recomendaciones planteadas por esta comisión de expertos, cuyos puntos centrales, como veremos en la presentación del profesor Loscher, abordan desde las renovables, la transformación industrial hacia nuevas tecnologías y productos neutros en emisiones, como es el papel de los combustibles, combustibles sintéticos de segunda generación. De especial relevancia en sus recomendaciones, como veremos en la presentación, son las cuestiones regulatorias, más teniendo en cuenta como los mecanismos actuales y los instrumentos de apoyo a las renovables o a la transición energética a veces han sido demasiado fragmentados, complejos y orientados en el corto plazo. Y aspectos cruciales como la reforma del precio de la energía o la reforma de lo que es el mercado de emisiones, es necesario abordarlos con un horizonte a largo plazo, garantizando esa transición energética de la forma más eficiente posible. Cuestiones, todas ellas, de gran relevancia y de gran actualidad. Y para tratarlas, contamos hoy con el profesor Loscher, como apuntaba antes. El profesor Loscher es catedrático de Economía de la Energía y Recursos en la Universidad de Münster, director del Centro de Investigación de Economía Aplicada en dicha universidad, director del Virtual Smart Energy Institute de North Rhine-Westfalia, entre otras muchísimas responsabilidades. Y como apuntaba antes, es el presidente desde el 2011 de la Comisión de Expertos del Gobierno Alemán para abordar la transición energética. Yo, sin más preámbulos por mi parte, eh, daría la palabra al profesor Loscher, agradeciéndote, Andreas, eh, tu participación en este seminario de FUNSEAM. Para nosotros es un orgullo y un placer contar contigo, con, tu, con todos tus conocimientos, para abordar una cuestión tan relevante como estas recomendaciones. Antes de cederte la palabra, solo eh, recordar a los participantes eh, si, la dinámica de, del webinario. Eh, a lo largo de la presentación está habilitado lo que es el apartado de preguntas. Os rogaría si podéis ir eh, planteando las preguntas que estiméis y al final, tras la presentación del profesor Loscher, procederíamos a lo que es el debate trasladándole las preguntas más relevantes y si nos da ocasión, pues todas aquellas que habéis formulado al ponente que las abordará en la parte final. Sin más, thank you, Andreas, for, your, for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot, John, for this nice introduction. Um, it's indeed it's my pleasure to to have the possibility to share some of the thoughts uh, with you. Um, um, I'm 
I am involved in the work of the chair and um, um, as well the um, IEB for quite some time and I appreciate a lot what you are doing. So I think it's great that you are as well uh, taking this initiative um, uh, to discuss this uh, very important uh, topic and uh, I think it's a very timely uh, topic, of course, uh, especially for a uh, German, but as well for European, uh, given that um, 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 we are in the um, discussion about the implementation of the Green Deal, uh, which will be a um, substantial uh, program uh, to defossilize the European economies in the next 30 years. And uh, on top of that, uh, we are just in the beginning of the German uh, Council presidency, uh, where we we are, of course, as well, um, uh, hoping to see quite some impact uh, on uh, the uh, discussions about the European energy transition and climate policy in Europe. Of course, this is all overshadowed um, by the uh, uh, Corona COVID-19 um, pandemic. So I'm going to start talk a little bit about um, the situation that we face at the moment um, and uh, then uh, try to um, develop a few thoughts about how we should uh, continue um, in these um, discussions and what might be the important areas um, of, of our energy or uh, climate policy and especially areas that combine these two aspects. Um, on the one hand, the recovery aspect, uh, but as well the necessary reforms to move into um, a more sustainable uh, growth path uh, for Europe. Um, there are two documents on which these um, discussions are going to be based. Um, the first is what um, Shuancha already introduced, uh, our report the report of the expert commission to monitor the, to the um, uh, German energy transition um, labeled uh, or with a header promoting climate protection enhancing prosperity uh, which was just published last month um, and I'm going to present some of the um, things out of the uh, report and there is as well an, a report by the German academies so Leopoldina, um, Akatech uh, in the union of uh, academies where I as well uh, was part of the working group and in this ad hoc statement uh, there are as well different recommendations on the energy transition and Europe's path to carbon neutrality. Uh, both of these documents are um, available for download in English uh, and uh, at the end of my slides I'm going to give you some references. But let me start um, with uh, first a few uh, on the corona impact. Um, and um, uh, to understand better the situation uh, that we are in today. And, and some of these uh, slides are taken uh, from uh, Aurora Energy Research. That's an, um, uh, a consultancy company uh, which I'm as well advising. And uh, Aurora has um, uh, looked at um, uh, some of the developments that we are seeing and we are likely to see uh, in the future. So first, if we look at GDP, uh, uh, of course, you can see that, you know, all the uh, economies are severely hit um, and that's true uh, not only for emerging economies uh, which uh, now uh, also see uh, reductions in GDP you see here uh, numbers for China and for India uh, but as well all the advanced economies um, with an with an average uh, reduction in GDP expected um, for this year um, uh, of about eight um, percent uh, you see as well Spain is harder hit uh, than Germany so in Germany we expect that uh, yes we are indeed severely affected uh, minus 6.6 percent um, uh, but there are other uh, regions that are uh, more severely hit, uh, hit by the uh, corona pandemic and that's not only true for GDP that's that's as well true uh, for some of the sectors in the economy so um, here on the left hand side you can see um, the impacts of the different con containment measures and um, how the different sectors are affected. Uh, that's of course mainly business trade, uh, the public sector, um, but it's as well uh, to some extent manufacturing utilities and construction uh, that are hit uh, by uh, the corona pandemic in the different uh, um, countries. Um, on the right hand side, you see the daily stock market performance by sector. And interestingly, you can see that many Many of the sectors actually they have reached again their uh, pre-pandemic 
um, level, uh, meaning that uh, the stock market seemed to um, uh, anticipate uh, a relatively uh, fast recovery in many of the sectors. Some, of course, are even better off, like the healthcare system. The only exception here is really the energy sector, oil and gas, uh, where uh, on, on, on average, the um, performance indicator are still uh, severely below the pre-pandemic uh, level, um, minus 25%. And why is that the case? Well, um, uh, you, s you know, of course, that uh, the uh, primary energy demand has decreased substantially. Um, and um, with these demand reductions, uh, we have seen a massive impact on the global resource markets, um, oil prices falling, gas prices falling, uh, but as well um, on the electricity markets. Um, so um, as I will show in a second, electricity um, wholesale prices have as well decreased uh, substantially. This had some impact, uh, of course, uh, on the uh, climate side. So uh, climate emissions uh, are expected to be reduced globally by 8%. Um, uh, uh, but I mean, this is uh, only a, a drop no, um, uh, in the sea because we know that we have to um, reduce emissions by about this number. Uh, six to eight percent every year uh, until 2050 uh, to reach um, these uh, two degree or even 1.5 degree targets. Um, so um, this just shows that, of course, even with these drastic changes uh, in our in the way um, our uh, economies are working, um, the drastic changes in mobility, uh, we are far um, behind schedule um, uh, in reaching these long-term uh, targets. And we as well have seen that um, th these um, minus 8% came with huge, huge costs. Uh, so it's really a call uh, for you know um, a, a wise um, and uh, economically viable way of transforming our economies and transforming our energy system. So we have to, to do that really smart and there's a lot um, to be done and uh, that will be difficult. Uh, and it will be difficult for several reasons. One of the reasons I show you here uh, you can see that um, um, uh, prices have been uh, decreased. Uh, I show you here the uh, the average um, uh, gas prices you now that are uh, lower than uh, in the uh, long term uh, average. Uh, you can as well see here the the German uh, base load power prices you now that are uh, below uh, the uh, historical averages. Um, so that means um, if we are now uh, talking about about recovery, um, it's as well very important that we set the right framework uh, for this recovery. And um, it's not automatically uh, going to happen that uh, investments are going to uh, go in uh, uh, non-fossil based um, uh, uses now because uh, we see that fossil prices are low. Uh, and they might stay low for the next years to come. And the same uh, is true with uh, wholesale uh, power prices. Uh, and um, um, we as well see that, yes, the uh, EUA prices have picked up a, a bit uh, recently, um, but all um, at the moment with a lot of uncertainty about the longer term perspective. Um, so again, uh, one of the uh, main recommendations later on uh, will be that uh, providing here a long-term perspective uh, on increasing uh, prices for the use of fossil fuel will be substantial uh, in order to guide the uh, economy in the right directions. Um, and that's important because uh, we see that, I mean, still um, GDP and CO2 emissions are uh, uh, closely linked. Uh, we see that in many countries, we um, uh, in, in the last years were able to um, decouple a bit uh, emissions per, uh, per capita and GDP per capita uh, uh, growth, which is a good, good sign. Uh, that happened in Germany, that happened um, in, um, in, uh, in the UK. Um, uh, here you can, uh, you can see Spain where it as well 
did a turn uh, for the good. Um, and um, uh, you see as well that there are still uh, there is still a lot to be done, um, not only in terms of relative decoupling, but as well moving into absolute decoupling and reducing emissions in the long run. And that's not only true for the US uh, and Europe, it's um, uh, even more difficult for many of the developing countries um, uh, uh, in, uh, for example, uh, also the, the big ones, the emerging economies, China and India. So when we are discussing now economic stimulus packages, um, we have to keep in mind both. You now we have to keep in mind the economic impact of these packages in terms of what is doing for the for the economy. Uh, but we as well have to think about what are the potential climate impacts. And that is um, extremely important if we are talking about now these different recovery packages. Um, and I show you here uh, a slide from a recent paper um, uh, by uh, Stieglitz, Heppen, Stern and others that um, try to um, assess uh, the uh, different um, instruments that are discussed in these recovery packages. And uh, these uh, instruments, um, they uh, are differently suited for what might be called a double booster in terms of boosting economic activity and uh, boosting uh, climate uh, change. Uh, reductions of CO2 emissions. Um, so there are some of these measures, um, you know, like um, uh, R&D spending, green R&D spending, uh, or clean energy infrastructure that have a potential uh, to not only be good for um, growth, but as well have high impact um, on um, the uh, environment. Uh, there are other measures that work in the uh, opposite direction. Uh, so uh, transport, traditional transport infrastructure and uh, airline buy bailouts uh, just as two extreme examples. Now with this said, um, one uh, can move and uh, compare what actually happened in the recovery packages and I just want to give you a very brief view on the German um, uh, rescue and uh, economic stimulus package. So we had a rescue package of around 350 billion um, now, which uh, included direct support for businesses and, and public health services. And we have now uh, just initiated two weeks ago a recovery package, uh, which consists mainly of um, uh, VAT reductions, um, then as well uh, some support for families, uh, social security, some for cities. And then there is here um, a part that uh, relates to future investments, um, uh, which uh, is um, not necessarily primarily green, but can be as well or is as well very important uh, for the energy transition uh, in terms of, for example, digitalization uh, and artificial intelligence, uh, which will play a role, of course, as well in the decarbonization. But we have as well as dedicated 40, 40 billion package um, uh, with green measures. And uh, this 40 billion package um, um, is focusing primarily on mobility. Okay, which um, um, I think um, is uh, a good development because Germany has really problems um, uh, in reaching its um, targets in the effort sharing um, uh, directive uh, on the in the transport sector. So this is for um, uh, innovation and uh, facilitation of EVs, uh, charging infrastructure, um, um, uh, innovation for buses, trucks, ships, aircrafts. No, they just open up um, uh, for new very big research um, centers uh, exactly on these topics um, um, that is all uh, uh, measure uh, here in the in the green measures um, it's as well uh, focusing um, to some extent on the power sector where uh, on the one hand of course um, uh, we have the um, target of 65% um, um, renewables in the German energy system. Uh, it's not officially in the uh, stimulus package, but it will be, of course, um, uh, having a huge stimulus um, uh, if we are um, uh, changing our transition pathway as well uh, for the um, wind and uh, the wind onshore and offshore and PV built out in the next decade uh, with a large um, uh, uh, volume of investments and um, there is as well 11 billion earmarked uh, for 
are keeping the feed-in tariff uh, stable in the German system. You know that uh, the, or you might know that uh, the costs of um, built uh, out of renewables um, is um, uh, uh, carried uh, by electricity users that pay a feed-in tariff and um, just by construction of course these feed-in tariff is going to increase because it's always picking up the difference between the market value of the renewables you now and um, the um, feed-in that is guaranteed for 20 years so um, given the reductions in the um, wholesale prices it's clear that uh, we have to pay more uh, for the renewables because they have these fixed remuneration. Um, so this is going to be countered uh, by um, this part uh, of the green measures. But well, this is uh, important as I will um, argue um, because we want to uh, look more on sector coupling, but it's not enough no, for uh, sector coupling because it's probably only going to freeze um, the um, uh, increases in the feed in tariffs. And the last uh, point I would like to talk about um, later on as well is the um, part of um, uh, the support of hydrogen uh, and uh, the German industry. That's uh, actually a big part of the package. You can see it's 9 billion, 9 billion euro um, that uh, is going to be uh, uh, used um, as part of this package uh, in order to uh, green, greening the industry uh, and support uh, hydrogen the hydrogen economy and I'm going to spell this out in more detail later on. So of course you might ask, so what's the role of these green uh, things? Well, um, um, it's I think it, it, it plays quite some role. So in, again, in our double booster idea, uh, there are uh, some of these things that can have a long run impact on the economy, uh, like uh, the hydrogen uh, I just talked about, like the renewables. Um, so Germany, for example, increased its offshore renewable target. Uh, we as well lifted our solar cap, no? so uh, solar support was kept uh, until uh, just last week. Um, um, uh, that was also removed and of course that can have as well a long run effect no? uh, with um, a lot of investments going to, um, in, uh, to uh, renewables uh, in the next decade uh, and as well uh, in uh, energy infrastructure that we are seeing here. Uh, and on the other hand, you can see that there are some measures that uh, probably need more support. Um, so one example here um, is the idea of um, 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 more by uh, more built out of a uh, railway and public transport um, that might be uh, more relevant in the future. Uh, I'm also going to talk a bit about uh, carbon contracts for difference. Um, so the, the question, how can we uh, defossilize um, um, the um, heavy industry in Germany? Uh, and the last topic um, is uh, power purchase agreements, no, which might be as well something uh, we have to use um, uh, uh, more in the future as we want to move away uh, from the feed in tariffs and move more into to uh, a market driven uh, build out of renewables. So uh, this is the um, this is the framework under which we came up with a set of proposals um, for the German government taking um, uh, um, also into account that Germany is going to have the uh, council presidency and um, uh, thinking about what would be uh, good areas uh, to push the agenda. And here you can see that um, we set up 11 um, points, uh, areas where we think um, it's uh, very important um, to uh, move ahead. And uh, first point um, um, I'm going to discuss in more detail is here the, um, the idea of strengthening European industry and increase uh, the international integration um, uh, of or ensure the international integration of the European industry. Um, a very important point is here here, um, uh, the uh, CO2 based energy price reform. So we are convinced that um, it should be via CO2 prices that we set the right tar target, uh, but we as well need um, uh, low electricity prices in order uh, to 
uh, decarbonize uh, to electrify these other sectors um, and this is uh, a very difficult um, problem in Germany but as well in other places. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about certification issues but this is really important so if we want to uh, really implement uh, these ideas we have to come up uh, with robust certification standards um, for hydrogen for example. I mean we are talking about in Germany a lot about green hydrogen but of course we know that most hydrogen uh, will um, more likely be um, uh, from uh, uh, from blue hydrogen, gray hydrogen, uh, purple hydrogen or whatever. Um, so this is something that has to be discussed and the same is true um, uh, uh, for the uh, discussion about uh, sheltering the European economies uh, from inf unfair competition uh, to the outside world. Um, so this is something I'm going to discuss uh, under the header of border carbon adjustments or carbon border adjustments um, and all this needs proper certification. So this is something that is really important um, and should uh, be tackled uh, with a lot of uh, sincerity. Um, I'm also not talking a lot about coal phase out. Um, uh, you have, might have heard that Germany decided to phase out of coal um, last Friday. Um, in the uh, Monitoring Commission, uh, we are convinced that the phase out schedule um, is uh, too slow in Germany. Um, this, the way they are setting up the phase out, uh, which is a, a phase out that's not done by markets, uh, but it's going to be done, uh, it's going to come with a high um, compensations, is as well not very um, efficient. Um, uh, so it's too costly uh, uh, and uh, too late. Um, uh, um, um, so this is something that that we, of course, as well tackled in these um, uh, in this report, and um, uh, and we think that um, renewables are one of the um, the, the really uh, uh, main building blocks uh, of this um, uh, re recovery, but as well in the, on the long uh, the long run. So 65% in Germany, and we know that of course the European and uh, renewable targets have to be increased substantially, and we have to move quickly on these areas. It's not going to be all electricity, so therefore. We talk as well about hydrogen and synthetic energy carriers. Uh, mainly, of course, as well in the industry. So that is um, uh, that is uh, for fertilizers, that's for steel and for other uses, uh, where we think it's really important if we are um, serious about industrial transformation um, that we are supporting uh, these technologies and we set the right framework uh, for these industrial um, transformation. We as well uh, discuss about in, uh, about expanding infrastructure. Um, that's of course as well a European topic. Uh, we know that it's not only electricity infrastructure, it will be as well hydrogen infrastructure, might be as well uh, CO2 infrastructure. Um, so there are a lot of uh, important decisions to be taken uh, and uh, they have to be um, uh, prepared today. The same uh, as I just said for the um, for the industry because we know that in some of these sectors uh, 50, 60, 70 percent know of the um, capital stock is going to be reinvested in the upcoming years. Uh, so we have a, a huge um, um, uh, danger of uh, running uh, into um, uh, path dependencies uh, or uh, into sunk investments. So uh, we have to be um, serious about that. I'm not going to talk a lot about energy efficiency. Of course, it plays uh, a very big role. I'm also not going to talk about um, uh, the uh, uh, activation of private capital. I think that's really a crucial point how we can steer private capital green finance into all these things that comes of course also with a certification issue and we know that um, the um, um, the um, European Union is pushing a lot there uh, on uh, the taxonomy and we support this fully and we think we should have clear rules know what, what should be sustainable investment in the future uh, in order to activate um, these um, uh, different uh, this uh, financial flows uh, to the different uh, renewable uh, and efficiency uh, and uh, in a broader sense sustainability uses. Uh, finally, um, we need uh, coherent uh, governance in the energy union and um, uh, we think that or we are convinced that due to the corona pandemic uh, policymakers uh, 
are um, uh, really occupied mainly um, with what I just described uh, with these um, uh, different um, recovery uh, uh, and support mechanisms. Uh, we fear that uh, there it will be very difficult you now um, to um, to spend the the same amount of political capital uh, on um, on uh, what would be needed in terms of uh, good governance in the energy union and uh, so therefore um, uh, we uh, as well try to spell out here um, what we think uh, relatively easy to implement measures that as well can guide you know, um, private um, individuals, households, firms for the next next decades to come uh, uh, and do not require a readjustment on a regular basis um, of these policy initiatives. I think that's really important uh, and it as well calls for uh, a coordination by markets as far as possible. Okay, markets can be really helpful uh, in these coordination exercises, and we are convinced that carbon prices play should play a really big role, um, uh, not only for the decarbonization, but as well to coordinate coherently policies uh, between different member states, between different sectors, and uh, between uh, different technologies um, in the energy transition. So this was a quick run. Um, uh, through our recommendations and I just would like to pick up um, um, uh, three um, uh, th uh, of these recommendations in a little bit more detail and of course in the questions and answer round we can as well um, uh, think um, more about how to proceed. The first one I would like to address uh, is um, the question of um, CO2 by based energy price reform um, and uh, I would like to start with a, a few on um, the German energy price system and it translates as well to many energy syst price systems in other countries. So um, the the German system um, uh, in the German system uh, we have at the moment uh, wholesale prices uh, for electricity between three and four uh, euro cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and uh, we see that um, households pay more than 30 cents per kilowatt hour. Okay, so we are moving from 3 to 30. Uh, why? Because there are, um, uh, of course, grid charges, there are electricity taxes, there are feed in tariffs, there are all these support schemes now as well, um, you know, for offshore wind, for uh, combined heat and power, and so forth, no? that all rest on the electricity price, which means that electricity is extremely expensive for businesses, in Germany around 70 cents uh, on average, um, 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 and for households 30 cents now, which means that um, um, in many of the applications, um, um, electricity is simply not competitive. And that's a problem because um, in the longer run, of course, we want to electrify our systems more. Uh, in the German case, we want to use uh, more heat pumps uh, for the heat sector, and we want to use more more electric vehicles for transportation and uh, this can only be uh, viable you now if um, most of these um, extra uh, um, taxes and uh, feed-ins um, and additional burdens are removed uh, from the electricity prices as we have them uh, today. So if we eliminate um, these levels um, I think we can see uh, much more progress um, in the decarbonization of these other sectors. Um, so most of the German um, 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 uh, real laboratories or uh, window um, uh, um, projects, they are just removing at the moment all these levies in order to see how we can make, for example, hydrogen uh, a, compet a competitive um, uh, technology in Germany. So uh, we have to do that. On the other hand, we have to as well make sure that we are securing and tightening our CO2 price path. Uh, because I showed you that with these low um with these uh, low um, fossil prices, uh, it's really crucial uh, that we get um, uh, here um, high uh, and reliable uh, CO2 prices for the future. Uh, we started this in Germany by introducing an emissions trading system in the non-ETS sectors 
in Germany. It's going to be effective uh, probably in 2021 um, um, with an uh, start price of 25 euros per ton of CO2. And then it's um, expected to increase. That's for the non ETS sectors. Uh, but we as well, of course, need secure and tighten CO2 price path in the emissions trading system in Europe as well. Um, so um, uh, we as well um, actually asked explicitly um, uh, for uh, a discussion of minimum prices also in the ETS, that's for Germany, uh, um, um, and um, as well uh, for a discussion uh, about uh, minimum price in the European system, which could be uh, evolving out of the market stability reserve, which at the moment is a quantity based mechanism to stabilize prices in the European emissions trading system. Um, I think or we think that um, uh, moving that to a price based system with a clear vision of how carbon prices will evolve in the next decade as in terms of a minimum price for CO2, uh, which would be much more helpful in guiding these longer term investments. OK, uh, um, if you go in Germany uh, to the um, to fill uh, fill up your car, you will see that the, the gasoline prices, they are at a level uh, of you know 10 years ago and probably even lower. Of course, this is not um, uh, a signal that we would like to give no to investors. That's the same uh, if you uh, are, are um, uh, fueling uh, or heating your house with uh, heating oil and so forth and so forth. So we need this long term perspective. Um, that, of course, is as well an issue for Europe because um, in the um, in the um, in the European case, we have, of course, um, now um, with uh, with the um, um, uh, with the burden sharing directive, uh, we have a mechanism how uh, we are introducing something like um, an emissions trading system between member states. Uh, but that has not been used so far. And um, again, I think it would be much better to move here as well to a, a European solution. Uh, how we can price these uh, sectors us better uh, and more efficiently over the different member states. And of course, that has uh, that can be done via the uh, European Energy Tax Directive. Um, and uh, it uh, might as well require that we discuss about um, uh, fair competition internationally, uh, for example, via uh, border carbon adjustments or other mechanisms um, to uh, secure a level playing field. In the German discussion, we always um, uh, had the worries that uh, this is unfair and uh, this is problematic from a distributional perspective. Um, in fact, I think it's it's quite the opposite. Uh, we know that um, if we are uh, if we are having uh, high CO2 prices and if we uh, channel back the revenues from the CO2 prices um, either by per capita um, climate uh, uh, payments or via re reductions in the electricity prices. Um, uh, there is a lot of literature now that showing that this is actually benefiting the lowest income households and it's as well benefiting um, relatively um, electricity incentive uh, intensive uh, but fossil extensive uh, businesses. Uh, and uh, many of them, of course, uh, I showed you the numbers at the very beginning, are hard hit by the Corona crisis. Uh, and a lot of these small businesses, uh, they can actually benefit from this type of energy price reforms. So it's really about um, uh, giving back revenues and if you do that um, it's actually um, a, uh, it can be a program that is more much more just than then many of the uh, measures that we see at the moment implemented uh, in the energy transformation um, just a word uh, on renewables um, well you see here spain is blank uh, because they had no um, no information uh, on Spain here uh, in this graph, but of course um, there is a lot of electricity production potential um, uh, from renewables uh, in the south and as well in the north. No, so it's not an issue of um, having too little potentials um, of moving faster into uh, the renewable um, uh, into renewable production. Um, um, I think it's um, important if we really strive for. A, a climate neutral Europe that we are making better use of these potentials that are spreaded all over 
Europe. No? And uh, again, from a German perspective, we see that, well, for us, this will be really difficult because our um, potentials are limited. Okay, so uh, if we look into the future, we will see that, yes, we are going to try to increase our um, renewable production. This is now going to be as well a lot from offshore wind, okay, uh, in the future. But we see a large resistance against uh, new wind onshore. Uh, in Germany, and we think that we are not going to achieve you no know, um, uh, these you know very aggressive renewable targets um, in the future on our own. So we need more um, renewable electricity coming from other European member states, and we need as well to import. Uh, more uh, energy uh, via hydrogen or synthetic fuels in the future. So uh, this will be a big part of the German energy transition. Uh, and um, uh, it's as well clear that this is a European topic. I'm going to talk about it in a second, a European topic. It as well includes electricity grid um, development uh, for making uh, the use of renewables uh, feasible uh, in the future. And, um, um, and it as well includes uh, I think um, um, uh, a more well centralized uh, thinking as well about support mechanisms. So it cannot be you now that we are only decentralized in the member states developing uh, support mechanisms. Um, uh, if we look at this map here, it's clear that we should uh, Europe uh, think of the uh, the support for the renewables in a more European way. Uh, and think about how we can uh, combine the national support schemes with as well some centralized support mechanisms in Europe. Okay, that really find the best places to locate renewables. Um, um, last point I would like to make is on hydrogen because that is, I think, as well a really important topic, um, uh, not only for Germany but as well for the European industries um, in order to uh, really uh, achieve climate neutrality. Um, and, and of course, as well from this industrial uh, policy perspective, um, we, we have to think about, um, on the one hand, how we transform and supplement um, existing value chains that includes European value chains as well, international value chains, um, uh, but as well, uh, it really uh, asks uh, for uh, a strategy uh, how we can get these renewable renewably generated electric power um, into these different use sectors um, uh, and uh, not only via electricity that's you know the heat pump the battery example I talked about um, uh, but as well uh, coupled uh, with hydrogen or coupled uh, via uh, synthetic uh, energy carriers um, that's I think uh, really a crucial point uh, as well for the industry industry strategies um, um, I uh, mentioned mentioned already parts of that before, um, uh, but uh, the idea, um, for example, for the uh, large uh, amount of money going to uh, hydrogen is really as well uh, uh, to support um, the uh, German heavy industry uh, in their transformation. Uh, and we know that this is quite expensive. So this um, um, is uh, something that will, um, um, will probably as well be not competitive um, at the moment. Um, so it might be an issue of discussing specific support schemes uh, like these carbon contracts for different no, difference uh, in order to make these um, business models viable. Um, it will as well um, um, include a discussion about uh, border carbon adjustment. Um, and uh, of course, it will as well um, need a discussion about uh, how the uh, the Green Deal, um, the um, uh, the um, increasing European CO2 targets, uh, are going to to be um, factored in uh, in uh, the EU ETS in carbon pricing in the other sectors, and how this actually um, uh, then plays out for industry. Uh, it's clear that it needs a lot of research development and uh, demonstration uh, and a lot of these projects are underway at the moment. Uh, if you uh, talk with uh, industry, you can see that um, that is really uh, crucial uh, and um, uh, it's as well, of course, an issue of infrastructure investment. So it's not only about the technology that has to be developed, but it's as well the infrastructure that has to be in place um, uh, for um, electricity, uh, charging infrastructure we already talked about, um, uh, but, but 
as well uh, for the uh, hydrogen economy and the question is how can we use uh, existing infrastructure um, um, as far as possible and how it has to be um, expanded uh, in the future uh, and a lot of these um, efforts are uh, on the way already but um, it needs to intensify really quickly. Uh, and the last word um, is uh, about um, this uh, coordination because I think that's as well an, an overarching uh, discussion uh, in the EU because of course we have um, very different governance structures at uh, EU level, at member state level, at regional level, at uh, local level. Um, and um, I'm convinced that um, it's, it's good to use um, market-based um, uh, centralized policies in order to ease the coordination across these different dimensions of the energy unions, you know, uh, of the energy union, of the regions, of the sectors, of the technologies. I think um, that is uh, really crucial. It as well helps uh, to resolve some conflicts that we see uh, between you know different uh, energy and climate policy instruments. We see that a lot in Germany, the these things are not well harmonized very often um, and uh, uh, these market-based approaches help um, to resolve some of these um, conflicts. It helps to coordinate uh, better um, uh, in the European uh, system um, and of course um, it's as well a prerequisite um, um, to uh, really um, implement all these um, measures that I just talked about because that is going to uh, depend heavily on the right framework um, of uh, the for the next years. Uh, the point is simply that you know the the recovery packages as we see them they are not primarily green packages. You can, I, I showed you the German example, and that's a big package, I would say. But even the German package, it's only about 10% now of the money now that can be really attributed to um, specific green investments. Um, so what we need is we need the right framework that all this other money uh, that we are going to uh, use in the next years on the German scale, on uh, on all the member states, uh, in all the member states, and in the European on the European level, as we are implemented, the Green Deal uh, um, is still going in the right direction. And for that, we need these high carbon prices. It seems it seems or it 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 it, it sounds trivial, but this is really. The, the way to look at uh, at it no and um i as well wanted to um argue that um uh, it, it, it 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 sounds um uh, counterinductive uh, inductive but we have seen that um via these decreases in fossil fuel prices there is as well there are new possibilities um to move ahead faster uh, with carbon prices um uh, as than we have thought before if we do it in a sensible way um, uh, combining it uh, with these um, energy price um, rebates of or some other uh, form of uh, recycling of these uh, income so this is um, um, what i wanted to um, discuss from my perspective today uh, you can find um, both instrument uh, the instrument of the expert commission and of the german academies um, uh, on these um, uh, on these websites and uh, now i'm very happy uh, to discuss with you um, um, some of your uh, comments uh, objections uh, or perspectives uh, on uh, this topic thank you Thank you, Andreas, uh, for uh, these uh, interesting presentations. And congratulations for the jo excellent job done uh, inside the experts commissions. Uh, we, ha we are on time, so we have time, enough time in order to discuss uh, some questions. I uh, invite the participants to uh, formulate the questions uh, in Spanish, in English, it doesn't matter. Um, the first question, the first question is related with uh, the phase out of coal. In your recommendations in the agenda, one of the recommendations is to phase out coal efficiently. Uh, I would like to ask if you can explain in more detail which will be the phase out of coal 
And related to this question, there is another question asking if you can uh, briefly update uh, the coal generation capacity in Germany and the timing of the shutdown of uh, coal generation capacity in in Germany. Thank you. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, so the, the coal, coal phase out in Germany, of course, is a crucial part of this decarbonization strategy. And um, um, you, you might know that in, in Germany, we, um, we have actually uh, done this uh, in a very specific format. So what we have done is um, we uh, actually um, uh, implemented uh, a commission um, that is uh, that was uh, um, um, uh, set up um, in 2018 um, uh, that tried to foster a, a consensus-oriented dialogue between different stakeholders and come up with a proposal to phase out coal. Okay, in the Commission, uh, they have actually um, uh, made a, a very concrete proposal on how coal should be phased out uh, in Germany. Uh, and this proposal has more or less um, three phases. Uh, let's say an immediate phase out, um, uh, then uh, the phase out until 2030, and then after 2030. And the original proposal was um, phasing out, you know, uh, I mean, we have uh, a bit less you know, um, than. Uh, 40 uh, gigawatt of coal capacity in Germany um, to phase out um, around one third uh, immediately and then uh, one third until 2030 and one third afterwards. Um, the, uh, the, the, the approach um, taken uh, was um, uh, the approach that foresees um, uh, compensations uh, for uh, specifically um, um, lignite uh, producers. Um, so uh, the uh, there was a uh, negotiation then in the um, uh, aftermath of these coal commission proposals in the implementation phase um, uh, to compensate um, uh, lignite uh, power plants, and um, that ha has meanwhile be uh, as I said signed. So there will be bilateral uh, contracts um, foreseeing that uh, indeed the lignite plants um, go out. A bit like I have described, but at the latest uh, moment possible, let's say. So um, um, there's not a lot happening um, in the 2020s. It's all being phased out in you know the last years uh, of the 2020s or the very end of these timelines. Um, so it's it has been postponed, and um, as I said, there were high compensations paid. Um, and that as well got a lot of criticism because we see that uh, coal is already phased out massively in the German market uh, because of uh, relatively high CO2 prices, 25 euros and, and more, uh, and um, uh, extremely low gas prices. And that has been accelerating in the pandemic. So gas prices have come down even further. And now we see that, you know, now um, gas power plants have not been competitive in Germany for a long time. Now they are, okay? And we see a lot of gas power plants in the markets. We see that hard coal plants are practically um, thrown out of the market at the moment. They are not really not really operating uh, anymore. It's really mainly lignite plants that are operating. Um, so uh, we think that you know a market driven phase out of coal would happen anyway in Germany. Uh, uh, a large part of um, the installation would close in the next years, uh, probably 50% or more, pandemic being even accelerating. Um, so there is not really a need you know, for compensation. Uh, and of course, if uh, we would combine that with, let's say, um, some indication of increasing CO2 prices, um, I think uh, most of the um, coal capacities uh, would leave the market pretty quick. Uh, it's only the relatively new ones. Uh, they, you know that Germany built around 10 gigawatt of relatively new coal power plants um, in the last 10 years. Um, and you would only have to deal with this part, uh, this share, you know, uh, and uh, think about what to do with these plants. The rest um, would be driven out uh, by market forces. And market forces means mainly CO2 prices. And of course, you could as well accelerate this by, for example, having some uh, national uh, minimum prices uh, on carbon 
um, if you are not satisfied with the performance of the EU ETS, um, and that was what I actually as well said in front of the Coal Commission, they decided to do it administratively in bilateral negotiations, um, and we see that from a political economy point of view that is problematic, difficult in the results. A lot of criticism nowadays. Um, the second question uh, concerns the European Union border carbon adjustment. Um, more exactly, the question is who is going to implement that and uh, what, which will be the mechanism behind this, uh, this border carbon adjustment. And the question, perhaps the most relevant question is how to monitor that this measure is not going to become a barrier to trade. Thank you. Yeah, I, I personally think, uh, and I've as well published quite some papers on border carbon adjustments. I think that is um, a, a really, really a problem. Uh, as well, coming out, of course, uh, of the discussion um, on uh, competitive concerns in industry, which I fully share. Uh, but we have seen, of course, that, you know, um, these um, support mechanisms were often not used in the way they were initially intended. Uh, so think about free allocation of certificates. I mean, uh, we know that this can be a very good measure if it's specifically targeted you know, to companies that need it. Um, um, in the meantime, now it has been used um, to uh, support many, many industries that probably would not have uh, really needed uh, this type of support. Um, and uh, therefore, of course, you would have to be as well very uh, critical uh, when implementing these new schemes. Now, um, uh, if you would implement border carbon adjustment, it would mean that you know uh, most of these other support has to go um, because then it's uh, another mechanism of support. Um, so you have to really um, uh, think about uh, where this is or how this is possibly as for politically. I think you have to be uh, really sensible not to be too broad and really focus on very few sectors. Um, and of course, um, uh, at the moment, uh, you you as well would have to demonstrate that this is really the the level playing field is really a problem um, and uh, that is as well something that you would have to ops to monitor um, specifically in an international context now um, so um, we'll see how the german uh, the european um, uh, co2 prices are going to evolve um, the border carbon adjustment for the price levels that we see at the moment is probably not necessary. Uh, we we think um, we, we can still be um, uh, competitive with these price levels. It's an issue if prices are increasing substantially now, but um, that would have to be monitored as well then. And um, we are as well discussing other options. Um, um, so there are other options. Uh, the free allocation was, of course, an, an idea uh, to uh, shelter uh, industry for from unfair competition. Um, I would say it, it so far it worked pretty good. No, um, so um, we have to keep that in mind when moving a new system. And of course, um, uh, there are as well uh, discussions of uh, um, uh, carbon uh, value added taxes, um, which is another possibility um, to take into account um, these options of unfair competition. Um, and um, uh, this is as well heavily discussed in Germany at the moment because it would not really um, uh, distort trade, no? but it would more or less uh, be an internal measure of German, of Germany, for example, uh, looking at the carbon content um, of uh, different products in the value chains. Uh, for all of these things, we need a proper accounting. And that is another thing we don't have at the moment. Uh, and um, therefore, I think most of the suggestions there on the table are for relatively simple value chains. Uh, uh, where there are no trade problems like cement. Okay, um, so it's it's neither complicated nor is it really sensitive because nobody. Uh, well, that it's not under m much scrutiny as well in terms of international trade issues. Okay, um, well we can start with these sectors, but be really careful when extending it. Thank you. Uh, we are moving now towards the renewables, and the question, one of the questions in the in the chat is. Uh, how to further stimulate uh, incorporate green gas 
into the energy mix, the new renewable gases, how to, to stimulate its participation in the new energy future. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there are at the moment um, um, different projects um, that are up uh, and and, and running um, uh, to do exactly this and um, I think um, the main uh, measure here uh, is um, is really uh, to set uh, here uh, to set in motion uh, these um, uh, what I described these energy price reform no because in order to have these green gases um, uh, somewhere um, uh, competitive, um, you need to have um, a cheap electricity from renewables. Uh, and uh, for example, one of the measures in the German package is uh, under the hydrogen frame is that um, all electricity that's used for uh, green gas is going to be exempted from feed-in tariffs. OK, um, but probably this is even not enough now. So you have to really think about how this um, renewable electricity can be. And I mean, it is cheap now for Germany you now because um, I mean, we, we have auctions for renewables and we see you now that these auctions, they come out with with very low prices. Um, um, we have uh, the auctions for the off for offshore wind uh, coming out with with uh, zero bits you now um, in Germany uh, in last year. Um, so these things um, uh, should as well translate in low electricity from renewables. So that's the first part. And we need these high CO2 prices. No? Uh, so we need much higher CO2 price at the moment um, in order to make this competitive. And third, uh, we need the infrastructure. Um, and that will be another issue. So the German gas um, infrastructure providers, no, they, for example, just have published their first uh, hydrogen uh, roadmap uh, in um, uh, in their long term planning. Uh, so you have to think how you are developing uh, exactly um, the uh, infrastructure for the green gases and uh, whether this uh, can use uh, existing uh, gas infrastructure, whether you need a new infrastructure um, that has to be developed, uh, what are the, uh, what's the focus of these developments you now um, in terms of as well, uh, where are the industries that probably need most of these uh, green infrastructure, uh, this green hydrogen. Um, uh, these are all questions that you have to start answering today. Um, in, in Germany, I should say that um, the the hopes um, on the dynamics of the build out uh, are very high um, uh, as well for green gases. Um, my, my feeling is given the um, problems we have with renewable development in Germany, we shouldn't be you know, over overly uh, optimistic. Um, we will see some of this, but it might be more. Uh, what uh, in, in fisheries you would probably say side catch, side catch. No, um, uh, when we are not really using electricity uh, in in other uses, uh, and then uh, it's probably hydrogen. No, uh, that can uh, play a bigger role, but but this might be limited for some time. And and in the report, you will as well find that we discuss uh, as well a little bit uh, more in detail, um, uh, for example, how this can be done in uh, the Renewable Energy Directive, for example, so RED2 and, 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 and what else can be done very directly you now uh, to bring in uh, more um, uh, green hydrogen. Thank you. Uh, continuing with the renewables, uh, we have uh, uh, different questions related uh, with uh, the offshore wind in Germany. The first question is if the system uh, can cope with the, the uh, significant increase in offshore capacity, which is the situation and the future expected for, for this technology. Uh, another question related with uh, offshore wind is if there is uh, any room in this larger target for floating offshore technology. And the last is a concrete, que concrete question that uh, what is your view on blackout in the United Ki Kingdom that was triggered uh, partially by an offshore wind farm and can affect the future of uh, this technology in, in, the, in, the, in this new scenario for the future? Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
to start with the last one, um, this really didn't make it um, to German news, uh, I would say. Um, so um, I think most people were not concerned so much about this aspect of offshore wind. Um, they are, let's say, more fascinated by the possibility um, uh, first to invest in large scale projects, um, which is, of course, um, as well desperately needed for many of the uh, German uh, companies. Um, uh, plus, um, it's as well going to be uh, indeed um, a focus point of the German um, Council Presidency. So um, the uh, development of offshore wind planning uh, across different member states um, uh, will be a uh, focus of, of the uh, efforts by the German government under the EU presidency. And they have already started you now to discuss uh, with the Q uh, UK, uh, with France, with other um, Nordic uh, partners and member states uh, to think about how uh, the offshore wind development can be done uh, in a uh, more systemic way. Uh, at the moment, um, uh, we have um, we see quite some dynamics in Germany, um, uh, and this is not only true uh, concerning the uh, new investments in offshore wind. It's as well true uh, concerning the targets for offshore wind deployment. Um, so um, our targets for offshore wind have been increased steadily over the last decade. Um, so um, um, in the in the decision taken by the government last week, we have seen another increase in the offshore target uh, from 15 uh, to 20 gigawatt by 2030. And uh, most analysts looking at the market um, are quite convinced that um, even these 20 gigawatt might be achievable. Um, um, but um, of course, how this is going to be used uh, really depends um, on the speed uh, of uh, grid development, um, um, transmission grid development in Germany. And you know that uh, there um, we are um, constantly lagging behind our own grid development plans. And it will be um, really crucial now um, to speed up this process. It's um, uh, it, it's it's not an issue of of money, you no, know, or or anything. It's really an issue of uh, public resistance, uh, with um, you know a lot of uh, court cases uh, against grid development on different levels. Um, and government tries um, to do a lot in terms of simplifying the procedures um, uh, and increasing the speed of these developments um, and we have just published the new grid development plan uh, last week um, and um, um, we can see that yes there is um, there is a substantial build out uh, necessity from the north to the south um, uh, if we really want to get these offshore wind 20 gigawatt by 2030 um, really integrated in the system uh, um, and um, I should say that of Officially, uh, 5 gigawatt of the 20 gigawatt in the hydrogen plan of the German government are earmarked uh, for uh, green gases, uh, for power to gas. Um, I am not fully convinced that this will be possible. No, I think um, we really need it uh, for, um, for our coal phase out huh, because um, I mean, if we are facing out not only nuclear next year, but as well coal, um, of course, we really have to think about what's going to substitute uh, these generation capacities uh, and renewables uh, will be part of the answer. Um, so I think we cannot uh, afford no, um, uh, to use, for example, a larger fraction of these offshore wind uh, if we get if, if, if we get uh, the um, grid extension uh, in place. Andreas, uh, just to finish on time, we are going to continue with the last two questions. Uh, the first uh, one uh, is, is about uh, CO2 tax reform. In your presentation, you are uh, defending the potential of this measure. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, as if you could explain in more detail uh, how these revenues coming from the CO2 taxes could be channeled to the uh, low income households. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so um, in the uh, in the run up of the um, German carbon pricing for the uh, non ETS sector, so for heat transport, um, agriculture uh, industry, um, there was uh, a lengthy discussion on how to make this socially acceptable. Um, because of course it's affecting uh, commuters, no, it's affecting house owners, um, especially if they are living in unrenovated houses. And um, this discussion, um, uh, as I said, uh, captured a lot of attention um, uh, on distribution issues uh, in the past. And um, there are different opportunities um, um, to address the issue. Um, so uh, one possibility is to give some type of lump sum payments to individuals. Um, so you use the income from CO2 pricing uh, and give it back to individuals by lump sum payments, which means that um, um, uh, here the uh, the the, the um, overall uh, effect um, is positive uh, for um, uh, households, uh, but as well for companies that um, consume under proportionally uh, carbon. Uh, and use uh, fossils no? and um, that is uh, typically uh, the case with low income households. No? So um, they uh, percentage wise they consume more energy uh, than richer households, uh, but on an absolute level they do less. No? So if you redistribute, um, you, the, you are uh, you're basically supporting these low income households um, and um, um, the these uh, lump sum payments is one opportunity. Another opportunity which uh, I was uh, supporting uh, is uh, you channel this back by reduced electricity prices. And the reason why I think this is attractive is uh, because it's as well helping systematically the energy sector uh, in its decarbonization um, by electrifying further sectors. And um, in this case uh, you would need the income uh, from the CO2 pricing uh, in order to get rid you know, of um, of these other things. So now uh, I told you the feed in tariffs are paid by the electricity consumers. Um, of course, you can as well uh, pay the feed in tariffs out of the revenues from the CO2 prices and that would reduce then the feed ins. And again, uh, that would benefit uh, all um, households um, and uh, businesses that uh, have an, uh, that are um, uh, heavily relying on electricity. Uh, um, they would again be better off. And we have uh, we have here uh, done some calculations um, what is needed uh, for for uh, financing uh, all the uh, these other costs um, on electricity, uh, you would need probably something like 50 billion to get rid of all these other things, uh, feed-in tariff being also already 25 billion in the German system. Um, so you would probably need something like a, a CO2 price of 50 euro or so. Uh, to compensate it fully. Um, but I mean, given um, that this is as well uh, a measure that's very close to the feed, we, we have a value added tax reduction in Germany now, 3% um, uh, value added tax reduction in order to stipulate consumption. Okay, um, uh, the electricity price reduction works in a very similar way. No, um, if you are reducing these feed-in tariffs, um, you know, households save. I mean, the the freezing of the feed-in tariff that is foreseen is going to give about 200 euros. Uh, additional um, uh, usable income to households, to average household in Germany. And of course, you can uh, uh, you can see that there is a benefit as well from um, uh, a more recovery perspective of these uh, measures. Uh, and uh, it, it makes not only from an well, energy system perspective sense, but as well from um, uh, from an economic development perspective, it makes quite some sense. Okay, Andreas, thank you. And the last question uh, is about uh, technology. Um, more concretely, the, qu the question is, uh, how do you consider the, the situation of the technology? Is the technology ready for the uh, targets, the policy targets that you are uh, defending? It is required something else. And related to this question, there is another uh, that refers to the transportation sector. Uh, the question uh, explains that 
obviously after the look the transportation lockdown the reduction in co2 emissions was just uh, eight percent a reduced percentage so uh, we have to face uh, the carbonization in the energy in the energy sector in the transportation sector and the question is how it will be possible with the situation of the technology available and also considering that uh, the decisions uh, depends on the consumers and which, which will be the role of the of the low carbon future fuels in this future. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think that are very good questions. Um, um, if you look at, um, I mean, in Germany, we had a very influential study uh, coming out of the um, German Industry Association. Um, and uh, this study looks uh, at carbon pathways to 80% and 95% reductions in Germany. And the result was uh, that 80% reduction uh, um, of CO2 of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 can be even positive for German industry uh, because it's securing uh, its um, export a position in many of these um, sustainable areas, uh, efficiency, renewables, systematic approach and so forth. Um, uh, with 95%, it was seen only positive uh, if we shelter the German industry uh, or we, if we have a level playing field. OK, um, the important thing uh, out of this study was, well, we have actually um, um, many options that are feasible um, um, to achieve our pathways in the upcoming decade or so. Um, and um, this can be done, let's say, with um, reasonable carbon pricing. Um, so, um, I mean, we, I talked about 50 euro per ton of carbon. I mean, it's clear that, you know, coal power plants in Germany and probably in most of the places in Europe would be gone immediately, no, uh, without uh, second thoughts. Um, so there are a lot of these options available at the moment. Um, there are as well some options for this deeper decarbonization that are at the moment available, uh, but not competitive. And I mean, hydrogen is a good example. Um, I mean, I'm as well in the working group of the um, ACATEC of the German Academy of Engineering and the German Industry Association. And the view there is, well, the technology is there. It's known. It's, it's, it's just too costly. It has to be scaled up. No, it's not that we have to invent something. I mean, it's good if we invent something new, no, but even with the with the um, situation at the moment, no, um, we could go a very long way uh, into the future. And so, um, so I think for this type of technologies, we really have to think about how we can bring down the costs in the future. Um, so this this is um, uh, R D and D. So it as well. I mean, it's, it's research, it's development, it's as well deployment of these technology that has to be supported, um, and uh, it as well. Uh, the question is as well, um, what is the infrastructure that we need? So, uh, I mean, in your transportation example, um, you do not necessarily have to decarbonize the transportation sector right away, okay? But you have to decarbonize it probably in the 2030s. But then in the 2030s, no, uh, you have to have a feasible alternative for consumers, which means that the technology has to be developed in a way that it's not costing too much extra and the infrastructure have to has to be in place. Yeah? And that means uh, the charging infrastructure, but that means as well, you know, public transport you know, and all the different alternatives you know, that you are then considering uh, if you want to change uh, or if you want to move away uh, from uh, your conventional combustion engine. Um, so this is not something that we need today from my perspective. I think there are a lot of other opportunities that can be easily developed via these higher carbon prices, but there are some options that um, we have to develop in the longer run. And there we need uh, technology support uh, and we need uh, all these you know, long term infrastructure issues to be tackled such that in the 30s, uh, in the 40s, that as well, I mean, other topic as well, all the negative emission technologies you know, uh, in the 40s. No, they have to be, you know, we have to start develop these opportunities today such that the carbon price can really rebid in the future. Thank you again, Andreas, for these detailed and in-depth answers. Uh, now it's the time to, to conclude. Um, 
como, si, como viene siendo habitual en todos los, los seminarios que venimos realizando en FUNSEAM, la clausura será a cargo de la profesora María Teresa Costa, directora de la Cátedra de Sostenibilidad Energética de la Universidad de Barcelona, con quien hemos organizado este, este seminario. Eh, Maite, tienes la palabra, por favor. Gracias. Uh, buenos días. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Andreas for a splendid presentation, plenty of contributions, as is usual when he explained something about uh, analytical aspect in energy or in economics in general, and um, for the rigor of the answer of the questions. Thanks, it's a, it's a pleasure yeah, and it's an honor to have Andreas as a member of the research team of the Chair of Energy Sustainability, IAB, of the University of Barcelona. Thanks for all, and I'm, I would like to, to underline some questions about do your uh, presentation uh, in order to closure uh, this event. I'm going to explain that in Spanish that we use uh, normally this language in this kind of events. Eh, gracias a todos por eh, la presencia en este evento que creo que ha tenido un nivel excepcional. Siempre queremos que estos actos eh, tengan algo de diferente de lo que suelen ser los otros eventos eh, que se realizan eh, presencial o online en estos últimos meses, aprovechando ese acoplamiento entre el conocimiento académico, el conocimiento científico y el mundo empresarial. Creo que esto es el valor añadido que la cátedra y FUNSEAN pueden ofrecer a todos cuantos estén interesados. Y déjenme señalar algunos aspectos que creo que, que son una contribución en su contenido y en su objetivo con la explicación que nos ha hecho Andreas de cuál es la situación y, hacia, y qué es lo que se debe hacer. Creo que el, este advisory committee del, German, del gobierno alemán puede extrapolarse al conjunto de países de la Unión Europea, porque atiende a cuestiones clave. De un lado, es evidente que la caída del Producto Interior Bruto, el deterioro de nuestras economías, va a ser de la profundidad de la que tuvo la, los países europeos y el mundo durante, después de la Segunda Guerra Mundial. Sin embargo, gozamos de instrumentos mucho más potentes y de un horizonte muy bien diseñado para poder transitar hacia él si realmente gobiernos y empresas encuentran la, un camino que necesariamente debía ser así para poderlo recorrer juntos y que el conjunto de la actividad económica y de la población pueda acompañar con los beneficios que de ello se derivaría a una nueva situación de desarrollo económico en el marco de el Green Deal, del Green Deal. Y esto es tanto más posible en la medida en que Andreas ha puesto de manifiesto en una de sus slides que llevamos ya una situación de decoupling, es decir, que podemos alcanzar crecimientos de, 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 de PIB, de GDP, con reducciones de emisiones. Y se trata de avanzar en este camino, en un modelo de desarrollo sostenible, en una serie de acciones que tengan beneficios para el entorno medioambiental y para el conjunto de la sociedad, por, por tanto. Aprovechar el momento que tenemos, que requiere necesariamente de un despliegue sin precedentes de recursos puestos en el mercado y en las instituciones por los diferentes gobiernos y por la Comisión Europea. Aprovechar esos, esos recursos para encauzar la economía 
hacia pues, ese nuevo modelo que eh, se basa en, básicamente en una producción, en un sistema económico que permita no ser emisor, ser neutral en eh, emisiones de CO2 y poder alcanzar lo que se acordó en el Acuerdo de París de, la, de los, no llegar a ese aumento de los dos grados. Creo que las contribuciones de, de Andreas se pueden clasificar en dos grandes grupos. En aquellos grupos que, de, 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 de contribuciones, de consejos que da eh, al, al gobierno alemán y que creo que son consejos para todos los países europeos, y es a la Unión Europea. La Unión Europea ha de tener no solamente una mayor integración de interna, una mayor cohesión, sino tener un papel en el mundo, una mayor integración internacional. Por un lado, comenzó, comenzó Andreas con este aspecto y lo cerró con otro aspecto de governance, que es la necesidad de una profunda revisión y reforzamiento de la governance de la Unión Europea tanto a nivel europeo, como sus directivas, como en las políticas nacionales, que han de estar acordes y armonizadas con las directivas, con acciones sectoriales enfocadas al objetivo eh, integrado de este modelo de desarrollo, al impulso de tecnologías que han de permitir alcanzar un crecimiento acorde con el Green Deal. Y esto va a tener debería estar acompañado de una serie de reformas más concretas, pero sustanciales, y que a España algunas de ellas son, le preocupan mucho. Una es la reforma del Energy Price System. España, mucho más que Alemania, tiene unos precios eléctricos muy elevados, que crean problemas de falta de competitividad en alguna industria, y que indudablemente con el COVID vamos a aumentar nuestras bolsas de pobreza y de pobreza energética y debería eh, buscarse soluciones para eh, resolver esta cuestión no menor, no menor. Nos ha hablado Andreas de la eliminación de los impuestos sobre la electricidad, la el reforzar el funcionamiento del mercado del CO2 y de la fijación de su precio y de compensar, de compensar lo, la, las caídas que pudieran venir de la, de la eliminación de los impuestos de la electricidad con ingresos procedentes de los derechos de emisión. Este es un aspecto muy importante y que sin duda debería, dará, dará imagino, en eh, los debates que tiene Andreas con el equipo eh, de, que, que preside de esta comisión, a un nuevo diseño del mercado eléctrico que deberá asegurar las inversiones a largo plazo con mecanismos, con subastas y, por lo tanto, mercados de capacidad junto con un mercado de ajustes. Es a lo que parece que es absolutamente imprescindible que vamos a ir máximo si además nuestro objetivo fundamental dentro del mix energético del sector eléctrico es el aumento de las renovables y el aumento de las energías renovables requerirá también tener precios que permitan cubrir las inversiones. Estas, estas actuaciones deberán ser tanto a nivel europeo como a nivel eh, eh, nacional. Pero, y quiero destacar algo que para quienes estamos en este evento forma parte de un asunto que nos ha preocupado siempre mucho y que no siempre ha tenido el tratamiento debido dentro de las políticas gubernamentales desde siempre. Y es la preocupación centrarse, invertir en tecnologías. Solamente el progreso tecnológico, los cambios tecnológicos, asegurarán este objetivo. El objetivo de tener todos los desarrollos necesarios para que los retos que exige el sistema productivo para poder seguir creciendo, crear valor añadido y crear empleo, puedan a la vez alcanzar los objetivos del Green Deal. 
igualmente acciones sectoriales dentro del sector industrial. Intentar hacer un package del desarrollo tecnológico, del desarrollo industrial, para poder crecer de acuerdo con los compromisos adquiridos. Expansión de infraestructuras, eficiencia energética y finanzas verdes. Es evidente que también al mercado financiero tiene un reto y tiene el reto de redefinir cuáles son sus mejores prácticas crediticias de acuerdo con los objetivos de unas finanzas verdes, siempre y cuando esto exige y por lo tanto se preste y lo acepte porque es para su propia supervivencia el sector privado. En definitiva, Andreas, creo que has puesto sobre la mesa los retos que por supuesto tiene Europa, no es solamente Alemania, tiene Europa y creo que el mundo. Lo que pasa que las diferencias en los modelos de gobierno respecto a países y a no miembros de la Unión hacen, si cabe, aún más dificultoso esta posibilidad de caminar en, el misma, en la misma roadmap. Creo, Andreas, que la presidencia de Alemania, y confiamos en la capacidad que tienes y que tiene tu comisión para asesorar al gobierno alemán, la presidencia de Alemania en estos próximos meses puede ser decisiva para alcanzar estos objetivos. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you very much. Gracias a todos. Bueno, decía que muchísimas gracias a todos. Con esto acabamos el seminario. Gracias, Andreas, por tu excelente presentación. Agradecer a todos los participantes pues, el hecho de que hayan podido compartir con nosotros este seminario y sus interesantes preguntas. Y desearos bueno, es que si no nos vemos, felices vacaciones y os informaremos del calendario de actividades de FUNSEAM a lo largo de las próximas semanas. Gracias.